Hello, everybody. It is so good to be with you this evening. And I have the honor of introducing quite an intrepid force. Nicole Garcia is the mission about the pastor at Westview Church, an affirming and welcoming congregation in Boulder, Colorado. Nicole has a Master of Divinity from Luther Seminary in St. Paul, Minnesota. She also holds a Master of Arts in Counseling from CU Denver and is a licensed professional counselor in Colorado. She works part-time as a therapist and a clinical supervisor with an umbrella collective in Boulder. And Nicole Garcia is the first Latina trans minister ordained by the ELCA. Please welcome Nicole Garcia. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. It's hard to know where to begin. So I'll begin with one of my favorite subjects, my second, me. <laughs> so I am a Lutheran, an evangelical Lutheran church in America. <laughs> and um, I have, I've had the distinct pleasure of being able to attend a lot of conferences that are primarily um, evangelical based. I was raised Roman Catholic and so coming to the evangelical world has been a breath of fresh air. I get to frequently listen at these, these conferences and, and in the last couple of days to some incredible music and what astounds me, it's all been written after 1800. And I'm so happy to be accompanied by so many of my Lutheran kinfolk. A lot of the times I'm the only Lutheran in an evangelical world. And the um, Lutheran uh, Office of, of Disability brought a, a significant number of Lutherans in and then seminarians from Pacific Lutheran Theological Seminary in Berkeley are here. So welcome to my Lutheran kinfolk. Now, before I continue on with the rest of my talk tonight, I have to issue a trigger warning. If at any time you feel the need to get up and leave, my feelings will not be hurt. Take care of yourself. You may, you have my permission, which you don't need, but if you feel you need to care for yourself and leave the room, please do so. And I ask that you would seek um, someone with a, a yellow lanyard so that you can receive pastoral care or mental health care. And as a therapist, I believe everybody should have a therapist. So please take care of yourself. And why do I feel compelled to talk about and give you an issue, a trigger warning? Because we're going to talk about a subject that is so difficult to talk about. Death, trauma, violence, and how it impacts us, and how it impacts us specifically as members of the LGBTQ community, for we are targeted. There is no doubt in my mind, and I've said it many times in interviews, and in fact, when I was um, ordained, Channel 7 News came in, and one of the questions they always ask is, well, how do you think um, you will be perceived in the community. And I said, well, there will be people who will not like what I'm doing. And I lived with a target on my back for many years. What do you think that might happen? They might kill me. And for the first time, a television program actually took that seriously and put it on the news. And members of my congregation and said, well, Nicole, aren't you being dramatic? No. This is our reality. The fact that we are outspoken and talk about Jesus Christ and Christians and gay and lesbian and bisexual and transgender and non-binary, we have targets on our back. And how do I know that's true? Because at so many trans nights of remembrance, I have read names. I've been out for about 15 years 
and every year I attend at least one, if not more, Trans Nights of Remembrance on November 20th and read names or give a benediction. I have heard hundreds upon hundreds of names being read. People who are transgender and non-binary who have been murdered because they have the audacity to live as God created them. They did not stay in the shadows. They came out and lived the lives they were supposed to live. And right now, I'm just gonna read a few names. And these come from the GLAD website. And these are just names up to November of 2019. And I was looking through my feed uh, last night and somebody said another trans woman was murdered on December 31st and I couldn't get any more information. So these are just a few of the names that you need to hear. Brianna B.B. Hill, Itali Marlowe, Jalea Jamar, B. Loves Seder, Bailey Reeves, Tracy Single, Bubba Walker, Pebbles Ladam Doe, Kiki Fantroy, Denali Berry Stuckey, Brooklyn Lindsay, Zoe Spears, Chanel Skurlock, Chanel Lindsay, Paris Cameron, Michelle Tamika Washington, Malaysia Booker, Claire Legato, Ashanti Cameron, Jazeline Ware, Dana Martin. And I could go on and on and on. And those are just the names of the people we know. So many times individuals are misgendered, purposely misgendered, do not become part of, God forbid, the statistics. And we don't know that they were actually trans or non-binary because their families dress them in drag, and then burn their bodies. That's the reality we live with. And going even farther, there are people who cannot or will not access their support groups or have access to mental health care or just feel so isolated that they take their own lives. The pain is so intense. And the only way to end that pain is to end their lives. And this became really personal in the past couple weeks. A beautiful young woman in her early 20s from my hometown, Louisville, Colorado. When she was 14, she came out to her priest at St. Thomas Aquinas Catholic Church where I attended in my uh, teens and early 20s. She came out to her priest as a lesbian. So he provided counseling and care for her to get over this attraction that they could pray the gay away. And it was in August of 2019 in the Denver Post where she was interviewed about well, in Colorado, the governor just signed a bill that said conversion therapy was outlawed for individuals under 18. So she was interviewed as an individual who had undergone conversion therapy and how it had destroyed her life, how it caused her to think of self-harm, how it caused her to shrink and not trust her own feelings. And a few months later, they found her dead at Gross Reservoir. That causes so much pain to know that in my town, where I could have been some help, where I could have provided pastoral care, I could have provided mental health care, I was not there for her. 
that hurts. And we have to recognize that each of us have been impacted directly or through secondary trauma. I didn't know this young lady. I didn't know any of the people whose names I read. But transgender women of color are being murdered. And look at me. I'm a transgender woman of color. My sisters, my siblings, my kinfolk are being murdered just for coming out and being who God created them to be. Yes, I have a bullseye on my back. Yes, they're going to kill me one of these days. And yes, I need to talk to my therapist about it because there are days when I just want to say, God, what the hell? What is going on? How come you're not stepping up? How come you're not protecting people? You put me here to do this work and I'm not doing anything. Then I have to step back and say, I need to do what I can do and I have to confront that anger, and I have to confront that grief and loss. So tonight, I'm sticking it in your face because we need to confront it. We need to look at it. We need to realize it's a part of who we are as members of the LGBTQ community. We can't run away from it, we can't hide it, but we have to find a way to look at it right in the face and say, you're not going to control us. Yes, I need to cry. Yes, I need to talk to somebody. But yes, I will do something about it. So, for about a minute, we'll have a moment of silence and think about the people in your lives that you have lost through violence, through trauma, or through suicide. And then after a minute, say out loud or in your hearts the name of the people in your lives that you want to remember. So Lord, let us pray in silence. If you feel called, say out loud the name of a person who was in your heart at this moment or hold that person in your heart. Alana. Now I must also take a moment. I think back to 2008 where I was in San Francisco and had the pleasure and honor of marching in the Pride Parade in San Francisco. And before the parade, I was doing what um, a newly out, a relatively newly out trans person should do, and that's sit in a bar. And I was talking to a group of, of men who were in that bar, and one of them just made the comment, well, at least it's not a dirge anymore. What? Well, back in the 80s and 90s, pride was essentially people carrying pictures of their loved ones who had died from AIDS. 
the men and women who were allowed to die because the government refused to do anything. And I would like to say that's over, but still, we have far too many people dying today from HIV and AIDS. So we must also remember those whose lives were lost out of hatred, fear, and ignorance. Eternal rest grant unto them, O Lord. May the perpetual light shine upon them. May all of our loved ones rest in peace. Amen. So as we look at death in the face, and do we sit and wallow and do nothing? Do we feel sorry for ourselves? Or do we act? Do we speak out? Do we show up at QCF? Do we find ways in order for our voices to speak out so that individuals who feel that they are lost have a beacon of light, have a beacon of hope, that they have someone that they can go to and talk to? How do we become leaders in our communities? How, and I would like to say, how do we reclaim our place in the church? Well, to be perfectly honest, we've never had a place in the church. They kicked us out as soon as they found out who we were. We were felled. I was talking today about that all are welcome. Well, it is bull. All are welcome if you want to be just like us. I will not put that on my church because I know that if somebody who has a swastika on their arm, they will not be welcome in my church. I'm just going to say it because I'm a human and I don't want my congregation members to suffer out of somebody else's hatred, fear, and ignorance. I recognize that. But what I do want to do, I want to create a church that is open, welcoming, and accepting that it is up to Jesus Christ, and I say it in my creed, Jesus will come down and judge the living and the dead. Not me. I do not have that power. Jesus Christ did not give Peter the authority to judge anyone. Peter was given the authority to proclaim the gospel, to proclaim the gospel of love. Love the Lord your God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. All the other commandments are based on these. Find a way to love God. And I was listening to my dear, dear kin, Kevin Garcia. And Kevin, I said, I love you so much, but I'm a Lutheran. I look at scripture first. <laughs> but that's for me. And I know that, and I realize that. I'm still amazed that everybody isn't Lutheran. We have this amazing theology. So come and see me after and... So what do we do with this? How do we step forward? How do we take a place in the church? And I went back to Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, because that's where most of the time we've been talking about 1 Corinthians and being a good Lutheran. I read before and after, and then another chapter before and another chapter after. And it came to me, 1 Corinthians 12, verse 4. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates all of them. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by one Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discernment of spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are activated by one and the same Spirit who allots to each one individually just as the Spirit chooses. That says, discover the gifts and talents God has bestowed upon you. God gave me a big mouth so I use it. God gave me a depth of faith 
that cannot be contained. And I have to stand up here, wave my hands, read from my Bible, and tell you, you are loved by God. Because I read in the scriptures that by reading these scriptures, you find faith. The faith that you cannot find in yourself is found by reading the scriptures. And I was talking with Luther tonight about the fact that you don't realize you are reading scripture when the band is up here. Do you know y'all read revelations all the time? Because so many of our, our hymns come directly from revelations. Every hymn that you read up here, you can trace back to scripture. Martin Luther told us that music is prayer said to a song. Music is incredible. Music is prayer. So if you don't feel comfortable opening up the Bible, listen to the band. Sing along. Look at those words. God is speaking to you through the words of Scripture, and you don't even know it. The Spirit will fill your soul and increase your faith. So many times I would walk into a room when I was working as a chaplain, and somebody would say, chaplain, if I could only have more faith, like I carried it in my pocket, or if I just said, you know, why don't you just go ahead and order them a little bit more faith? Do a little pressure here because that's where the faith gland is. <laughs> but I, what I would do is open up my Bible, and I have to say, I always have a go-to verse, and I would read to them, And I would read to them, <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. If that person hadn't been in church for 25 years, they would know the 23rd Psalm. And when I left that room, they had more faith. I would like to say it was me because I'm a great chaplain, but it's not true. It was opening up scripture and reading from the word of God that this person's faith was increased. I have really good friends who can sing. I can't sing. I used to sing better when I drank. I don't drink anymore, so I don't sing. But the pastor that I worked with had a beautiful golden voice. And when she would do pastoral visits in the hospital, she would bring her hymn book. And she would sing the songs that people knew. She was praying to them to music. So I go to scripture and carry my Bible wherever I go. Find what works for you. Is it singing? Is it doing daily devotions online? Is it sitting and talking with someone in a coffee shop? Is it making an appointment to go in and sit with your pastor? Or is it simply just sitting and being? I know so many people, especially in Boulder, who say, why well, find God in the mountains on a path? And I go, ha, 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 maybe they're right. <laughs> maybe that's where people do encounter God. It might not work for me, but guess what? I'm not everybody. Find what works for you. Find those gifts and talents. Nurture them. Grow them. And before you know it, you will be put in a position that you might not ever think you would attain. It was just about six weeks ago when my mother and sisters placed a stole on my shoulders, the yoke of Christ. I never thought that the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America would ordain a transgender Latina. It was ludicrous. I knew they were thinking ahead, but me? Would they want me? And when I sat in my bishop's office and he said, all right, here's your letter, when do we want to do your ordination? What? And I had 
over 240 people who I love there, 35 members of clergy who I love there, celebrating this incredible day with me. I never thought it would happen. So start dreaming. Start thinking about how you can be a leader in the church, how you can share your faith with those around you, how you can speak out and claim your place in the church because it doesn't belong to anyone else. The church belongs to our Lord. I work for Jesus, no one else. And I'm here to tell you, you have been called in the name of Jesus Christ to proclaim the gospel, to pro proclaim a gospel of love and acceptance. But I do have to warn you. One of my favorite theologians, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I've been reading Bonhoeffer a lot these days because of things going on in the world. And for those of you who don't know Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he was um, born in the area of the Nazis. He was a German, and he spoke out against um, the Nazi regime, and eventually, um, about a, two weeks before Hitler committed suicide, Bonhoeffer was hung for being part of a plot to assassinate Hitler. Part of his writings, this came from a sermon that he wrote for Advent. We have become so accustomed to the idea of divine love and of God's coming at Christmas that we no longer feel the shiver of fear that God's coming should arouse in us. We are indifferent to the message, taking only the pleasant and agreeable and forgetting the serious impact that the God of the world draws near to the, to the people of our little earth and lays claim to us. The coming of God is truly not only glad tidings, but the first of all frightening news for everyone who has a conscience. We are loved by God. Your sins have been forgiven. You have been given that gift of grace, and now you must do something about it. You must share that gift with everyone around you. You must share the fact that everyone should have a roof over their head and food in front of them and clothing to wear. They should have access to a shower. They should have access to medical care. They should have access to what they need in order to survive in this world. And as Christians, we are duty bound to do that. We have to speak out and remember our dad and then fight for them. Fight on behalf of them and ensure that no one else loses their life because they live as God created them. We have a duty to speak out and tell the world you are loved by God, we are transformed by God, and we are here to live for one another that we are here to share out of our abundance, that we are here to share out of our love, that we are here to lend a helping hand, and by God, it is so hard. It is the most difficult thing that we can ever do. Right now at my church tomorrow, they're putting together bags for the homeless. And I think to myself, we're, de we're determining what people need. But people want to do something. And we've been told that, well, if you just give them cash, then we're just perpetuating. And I'm like, we need to do something. What do we do? Yes, we will give to Community Table. And yes, we will give to, to St. Carmen. But we need to do something. So one of my congregation members has an excess of fabric so she's sewing bags about the size of a gallon, a gallon Ziploc bag, because I don't want to give out Ziploc bags. She's doing fabric bags so they can be used over and over again. And people are bringing out of their abundance, out of their excess, toothpaste, socks, toothbrushes, soap, combs, anything they have. Is it enough? Oh, no. Not even close. Is it something we can do? Yes. It's something. And if we keep just doing something 
over and over again, find another something, find another way to reach out. We have land that maybe we can build a little tiny house village, I don't know. But we have to dream, we have to think outside the box. We have to tear down the damn box and build something new. We have to dream big because our Lord Jesus Christ thought and dreamed big. And we were given the gift of grace to free us, to free us from thinking, well, I have to do something to save myself. You don't have to, you've been saved. Praise Jesus, thank God you have been saved. Stop worrying about yourself and start worrying about your neighbor. <laughs> For you have been blessed. And if you are here, you are truly blessed in many ways. But that gives you the yoke of Christ. That has put onto you the necessity to go out and be Christ in the world. Let us pray. Almighty God, he sent down to us and came onto this earth incarnate of our blessed Virgin Mary and became Jesus and walked on this earth. You were not born of the rich and privileged. You were born with the poor and the oppressed and you lived with us. You ate with us. You shared our poverty. You shared all of who we are. And then the great and mighty tore you down, but you destroyed death, overcame death, and gave us that gift of grace. We ask now that you fill this hall with your Holy Spirit, take us out filled with the love of God, so that we too may raise all those to you and let everyone know they have been forgiven and loved by God. And all of God's people said, My name is Isaac Archuleta, and as I mentioned before, I am completely thrilled to be here with you this evening. I had the great privilege of creating both this year's conference theme as well as its ethos. It was in doing so that I looked into and considered our progress, our progress in the social political sphere, as well as the many advancements we've made in our religious spaces. Despite some of our major successes that we've experienced, many of us still grapple with the mechanisms of relationships like communication, respect, boundaries, consent, mutuality, and managing our own immaturities. Relational justice is our next frontier. Communing is the great practice we must embrace. As Christians, we discover relational justice in community. And in order to commune, we must look from where we've come. I'd like to take time this evening to remember those who have paved ways for our successes, those who had to endure a battle for what we so freely access. We truly stand on the shoulders of the LGBTQ plus lives who have perished, and may we never forget the prices that they've paid for our comfort, our ability to live in a very out version of communion. I am focused on and sometimes concerned by the ways we do relationships. And in my perspective, if we were to use the momentum from previous generations for which we must remain forever thankful, we can take time to reclaim our desires. As a little boy, I was taught that my desires were my enemies. My desires, like being held by someone of the same gender, to be feminine, artistic, or to be a love by a man who smiled at me ever so sincerely. My desire to want a Lisa Frank Trapper Keeper instead of a G.I. Joe Binder. 
My desire to want to karate chop the Power Rangers in trade for a good old episode of Oprah with a Weight Watcher shake. <laughs> and finally, to fall in love with a man. But those desires were categorized as wrong. They were also proof of my defectiveness. At least that's what many taught me. Of course, this is my unique version of the homophobia that I have survived through and how it affected my life. But essentially, when people in churches teach us to despise our desire, they inspire our divorce from our own authenticity. And when we've been trained to believe that our desires oppose God's will, it is inevitable that we will eventually believe that we oppose God's will. I used to think that God was like Santa Claus. Someday, once I fasted two meals a day during high school, and once I prayed fervently enough and behaved well enough, God would deliver a package of heterosexuality under my Christmas tree. Surely, God would give me the desires of my heart, the Bible promised. And I wanted nothing more than, the de than to desire what everyone told me I would want a heterosexual lifestyle, whatever that means. But thankfully, God is not Santa Claus. It took me a while to learn that God gave me the desires themselves, the desire for connection specifically to another man, the desire to express femininity precisely as a gender non-conforming person, the desire, the desire to belong just as I am, the desires that I had been had been trained to fight against were actually my gifts from God. My relief wasn't something I should anticipate because the way I would find relief was by embracing that which God had already given me, the desires of my heart. And I dare say that our desires are given to us to guide our blossoming, to facilitate the expression of our authenticity. Essentially, our desires are our compass, forever guiding us forward. I always say this because I believe it's incredibly important. Sexual orientation and gender are not necessarily mechanisms that merely guide us to whom we think we might enjoy sleeping or to inform how we should express our gender. Sexual orientation and gender are the internal coding that, when activated, manifest God's desires through our lives. I could not, however, reclaim my desires had it not been for the generations of LGBTQ plus persons who fought hard for our social and relational equity. Those who have gone before us were not only fighting for their civic rights, for social acceptance, and relational credibility, they were, with the fight of their lives, recategorizing LGBTQ plus desire by standing in, fighting for, and defending their authenticity, they were ever so boldly told, telling the world, that their desires were right, innocent, pure, and God-given. By standing up for LGBTQ plus rights, they were paving a way for a comprehensive, comprehensive expression of God as love. Love for God, love for our neighbors, and love for ourselves. They paved a way so that our steps can be in line with the calling that beckons us forward, so that as we take each step into becoming authentic, we leave behind the filters, the facades, the shrouds that people placed and wrapped around us to convince us that we should live life as though we are dead inside. But those we remember today have given us the ability to live with vitality, freedom, and courage. And may we never forget their legacies on our watch. To embrace and honor the identities of lesbian, trans, bi, demi, asexual, non-binary, non gay, or queer, means that we had to go deep, deep into a layer of our internal structures to identify the desires God had given us. And then we had to muster the courage to stand against hatred to declare for all to see how God made us to live fully vulnerable so that God could be seen precisely because we were courageous enough to be honest about our divine blueprints. You are worthy, yes. You belong, 
absolutely. You are utterly special. God, I hope you don't just know it. I hope you feel it. But just as equally true, we need your presence. Communion cannot happen without you. You are not merely welcome to the table. Your spices are necessary. Your unique contributions to humanity are needed. Otherwise, God's banquet table will be incomplete and the recipes will be soured. To our trans siblings who died because they were honest with who they were. To the adolescent whose world was too harsh, leading to a hopeless suicide. To the social advocates here and afar who stood for God's truth. To the lineage of our deceased LGBTQ plus siblings who made our internal reconciliation all the more possible by fighting for their gifts and desires. Tonight, we remember them. As we embrace our authenticity, may we remember them. As we reclaim our desires and hold them as precious gifts from God, we remember them. And as we commune with one another, we are thankful for the road you paved and the road it took to get us there. Let's take a moment to remember the LGBTQ people we've lost and as a way of paying homage and thankfulness to them, I want you to think about one desire that is authentic and pure that you may need to embrace. creator of life, master engineer of our bodies and our souls. Thank you for those who brought your kingdom to earth by their bravery to be who you created them to be for all to see. May we take their momentum and continue to shine with love for you, for our neighbors, and love for ourselves. We feast from one table where all are welcome. We wrestle with equity because all are necessary. We create safety for the rejected so that all are honored. We hold true to God's undying love for all, since all are God's beloved. May we enter into this blessed communion and, just as God loves us unceasingly, may we reflect the divine increasingly. Amen and amen. You can very easily and seamlessly move from here to Caribbean 5 for the QCF sharing time, but for now, this concludes our time together up here.